Okay. Good. Now we see. Can you see? Good. And I'll go into full screen mode. Here, sorry, okay. y'all. We've got our technical difficulties as we're learning Zoom. And everybody can hear me clearly, correct? Yes. Correct. Good. Okay. Well, um, following on from Allison and Stephanie, what I'm going to do on my presentation in the next oh, 25 minutes or so is kind of give you the idealized view of Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act. Um, but starting out and kind of reflecting what Ellison was saying is, you know, we're now doing virtual training um, successfully. I think we've got almost 100 folks here. And um, we are changing. And one of the first changes you'll notice on this screen is my telephone number is now my new number of our DAP cell phones. Part of the cost-saving measures for COVID as we grapple with the kind of fallout is we've got rid of all the landlines. So all of those landline phone numbers, starting with 586, on all my letters and easy one forms and all the rest are gone. So this is a new phone number in case you need to contact me. And our email, of course, are, are, is here. So that is the same. Well, what I wanted to start out with as Stephanie mentioned, 106 is kind of the overarching federal law as part of the National Historic Preservation Act. And Allison also noted and mentioned how we're all in this together and we rely upon your eyes and your documentation efforts. But it's also important to note that you are part of a larger global kind of enterprise and industry that every nation has a, uh, a series of laws protecting its cultural, historic, and archaeological heritage. So wherever you go in the world, you're going to be dealing with archaeological sites and that there are your peers today working in Asia, Europe, Africa, South America, and all places in between documenting and working to protect and interpret archaeological, historic, and cultural places. So, you know, you are part of a kind of a global both industry and cohort of professionals whose job and, and career and dedication is to kind of protecting and interpreting that past. So we kind of thank you for that and your efforts. Just everybody can probably identify some of these, the tombs of the pharaohs, the pyramids, the Chinese warriors. This is, of course, a Roman aqueduct through uh, Gaul and, and uh, Europe. And this, of course, is the foundations in London of the Globe Theater. Um, again, archaeology is everywhere. And in Washington State, you know, we've got 27 to 30,000 archaeological sites so far documented. And archaeology is in every county and locality in Washington. Well, today's kind of podcast, mine is half an hour, uh, giving you the kind of the DAP view of 106 and a highlight one for half an hour. There are, however, multiple day classes and sessions on 106, and almost every slide that I go through can be its own workshop session. So uh, it's important to kind of understand while there is some kind of elegance and very linear lineality in terms of Section 106 as a process, uh, there is complexity at each one of the steps, and each one has now over um, 50 years of case law, of industry standards, of uh, agency practices and policy and kind of academic uh, insights and public expectations. So um, we have all of the uh, material on 106 on our web pages at dap.wa.gov, but also the ACHP which is the agency that is responsible for the Administration 106 uh, 
regulations uh, has it at theirs also, along with best tips and practices and even case studies. Well, in the U.S., protection of archaeological, cultural, and historic sites is not new. It dates back before there was the United States. In fact, some have said that the founder of American archaeology is Thomas Jefferson, who explored archaeological uh, mounds on his uh, home, Monticello there. And in fact, today, as part of that presidential homestead, there are archaeologists actually investigating the archaeological record of his occupation in that. So, you know, the interest in the past is, one, global. Two, it has a deep standing uh, interest in the public and in government role. And in fact, um, some of the earliest kind of political and civic engagement and movement was historic preservation. You know, the, in fact, the grandfather, maybe the, more appropriately, the grandmother of historic preservation in terms of their efforts before there was any laws, shortly after Washington passed on, was to form the Mount Vernon Ladies Association long before they had the right to vote or other civil kind of uh, engagements to protect Mount Vernon. And it's still kind of one of the only presidential homesteads in private ownership by the Mount Vernon's um, Ladies Association. Well, government's role in historic preservation started early on. In fact, before Washington was a state, it was litigated in the famous case of the U.S. Department of War versus the Gettysburg Electric uh, Railway Company. Again, following the Civil War with a huge number of battlefields which tens of thousands of Americans had died at. You've got the industrialization of America, the, the railroad construction, other efforts. And this was litigated to the Supreme Court. And in 1880s, the Supreme Court ruled that government has a legitimate role in protecting and preserving those sites that define what we are as Americans in terms of our shared historic and cultural experience. So this, at the time, historic archaeological site, Battlefield of Gettysburg, uh, was threatened. And today, of course, it's part of the national park system, uh, protecting and interpreting the meaning of that role in American history. Well, following World War II, you know, we had the uh, major infrastructure construction activities, interstate uh, uh, highway system, the uh, dammings of the uh, Columbia, Snake, Missouri River systems and others. So you had a huge kind of federal involvement in construction activities that were changing the landscape and face both of rural and urban America. And so by 1966, you had the authoring and signature of the National Historic Preservation Act. And here it is, the upper uh, left is uh, Johnson signing into law the National Historic Preservation Act, in one sense kind of the grandfather, grandmother of kind of environmental laws. And here in the lower uh, right is Richard Nixon signing in, in 1974, the National Environmental Policy Act, NEPA. So you can see how kind of uh, that time period was uh, instrumental in establishing the kind of foundational elements of what we view today as the kind of contemporary historic preservation and environmental movement, 1966-1974. So, you know, we have many calls where people discover Section 106. Geez, never knew about that. What, what, it's not new. So it's been lost since 1966. And over that time, the last 50 uh, four years-ish, there's been a number of um, uh, amendments and iterations 
The most recent was back in 2001 uh, involving uh, uh, changes for the inclusion of Tribal Historic Preservation Offices, TIPOs, and, and broadening out kind of the, um, the range of types of properties that are considered under an HPA in Section 106. The important takeaway for National Historic Preservation Act is it's a process, okay? Unlike others, such as ESA, Endangered Species Act, that has certain kind of defined outcomes, the National Historic Preservation Act, like NEPA, is a process, and it requires that the federal agencies look, listen, and take into account the environment, and in our case, historic properties, before they make a decision. And so that's important because for you, you are a key part of that process, either as an agency representative, as an archeologist, or other that is providing the technical documents from the consultants um, so that the responsible federal official can make a sound technically based decision and consult in such a manner with our office staff as a SHPO and with the tribal governments and TIPOs and local governments and the public. Um, so those are these kind of three takeaways, I guess. The process, the 106 responsibility of the federal agency, and it is consultative. What does that mean? It means that the agency is coming to our office, to the tribe, to the public with open ears, with open minds, to take and uh, get the best information from its technical staff and from others to reach a decision. So as I said, requires substantive technical information. That is the historic uh, properties, forms, archaeological site forms, the professional cultural resource survey dealing with archaeology, historic properties, traditional cultural places. It involves a number of parties that have different roles and responsibilities and sometimes access to information. And this last point is important, is that while in the last kind of 35 years with amendments and other changes that we have seen in guidance and policy, it, there has been a general evolution of the process to a more consultative process, open ears with more parties that address a greater range of kinds of resources that are out there. So that is kind of important points to think about in terms of how the process has evolved over these last 50 years. When it was signed into law back in 66, um, many folks were probably just thinking solely of Gettysburg or solely of the Statue of Liberty or Independence Hall or the Alamo. But now of the evolution of the National Historic Preservation Act, more and more types of resources important to very specific and distinctive cultural historic communities are recognized as being considered under 106. The key first step in whether deciding if it's a section 106 is the concept of undertaking. And you know, we talk about projects, uh, you know, wizard, and you talk about all kinds of projects. But this is the legal definition. It means a project, an activity, or a program funded in whole or in part under the direct, indirect jurisdiction of a federal agency. Those carried out with federal financial assistance, that is money, those requiring a federal permit, a license or approval, those subject to state or local regulation administered pursuant to delegation or approval by a federal agency. Let me just take and talk about this. Stephanie uh, mentioned uh, 
follow the money. If you're dealing with any federal money in terms of grants and other federal assistance, it triggers 106. HUD housing projects for homeless, for low-income housing, funding those, rural development, agricultural uh, loans and grants, uh, any money triggers that 106 uh, action. Federal permit. We deal with dozens of federal permits, and they range from anything like the Corps of Engineers permit for uh, wetlands uh, to um, other kinds of permits, um, licenses, probably the most familiar licenses for many um, at both a macro and, and micro scale are either the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission license, which the agency that regulates the federal hydroelectric license projects like Chelan County, Grant County PUDs, uh, Puget Power, Seattle City Light, all of those have 30 to 40 year federal licenses that trigger Section 106 and compliance. Approval, we see all kinds of approvals, easements, raising allotments, uh, approvals of uh, uh, timber sales, all those uh, are covered. So we deal with like close to eight to 10,000 projects a year in Wizard. And this morning, what, I think the last wizard project I saw was the number was over 6,000 so far we've got in under both uh, federal and then 0505 or local government. So, you know, we deal with reviews on an industrial scale, and a good number of them are federal because a third of the state is federal land, Forest Service, Park Service, military, all requiring Section 106. Um, we take and deal with federal permits because of all the waterways and because of kind of the other kind of overarching regulatory environment that require federal permits or licenses. Now, the last sentence is particularly appropriate for some state agencies. Those subject to state or local regulation administered pursuant to delegation or approval by a federal agency. Probably the two that come closest to mind are probably the EPA uh, delegates a certain approval authorities and funding to the Department of Ecology and Department of Health for water quality uh, and for other kind of grants uh, as pass-through monies. So they delegate to the state agency. So we, we while this uh, presentation kind of runs you through um, the main kind of freeway of how 106 works, there are significant kind of little off-ramps that give added complexity. So ecology, health, even RCO, Recreation and Conservation Office, has passed through money from the Land and Water Conservation Fund with delegated authority. Um, and so all those are doing Section 106 on behalf of the federal agency. Similarly, uh, federal highways uh, monies go to Washington State Department of Transportation. And so you see transportation projects routinely uh, 106 because of the federal money with delegated responsibility through a programmatic agreement to Washington State Department of Transportation. So we have federal undertakings, and a good number of them are delegated to some state agencies. Again, from agriculture to whatever a Z uh, entity would be in the federal government, we deal with thousands of different projects. Some that um, are not readily recognizable, FDIC ATM machines, they require a license. Every new bank, uh, we do uh, reviews for all branches in the state because they require an FDIC license. Okay. Um, not all undertakings have the potential to affect historic places. Okay, every decision a federal agency makes is subject to 106. 
However, there are certain kind of categories that we don't routinely deal with. Social security payments, student loans, purchases of pens, computers, things like that, that the federal agency has a discretionary decision to make about doing, and it does, but because of the nature, they don't affect historic properties. So they're called no potential to affect and NPCEs. But it's important to note that whenever you alter the landscape, you have to assume that that decision is one that you're making and no potential to affect historic properties um, will not apply because you must assume that a historic property is there when you try to make that decision. Traditionally, the focus of 106 has been land altering activities, whether large or small, capital financing that alters buildings and the landscapes. So those have been the kind of uh, typical kind of 106 activities. The key participants, as we've talked about, the person, individual in the driver's seat is the federal agency or agencies. When there are multiple agencies, and we have that quite common um, with federal permits, federal money, and sometimes federal land, you can have potentially three or more involved, federal landowner, a federal funder, um, and maybe even a, a kind of federal permitting overseeing them. So those have to get together and decide amongst themselves who is going to be the lead. And that's something they decide upon. And usually we see that which has the greatest interest involvement um, will usually be the lead. The Tribal Historic Preservation Officers, we have um, a large number of official THPO offices in Washington, I think, what, maybe 15 now at last count. Um, and they take and have jurisdiction for all Section 106 decisions within their exterior boundaries of the reservation. And so that's an important key for you to know if you're a consultant or if you're a grant manager, that you consult with them instead of the SHPO when you're within their external reservation boundaries. SHPO, that's us, that's Allison and the DAP staff. The applicant for funding or the permit or the license uh, oftentimes is involved in a role, particularly for some of these larger projects like, you know, hydroelectric projects, things like that, complex ones. The ACHP in Washington is usually involved where it has to sign an agreement document. All agreement documents are signed ultimately by the federal agency and the SHPO with TIPO being either a signatory or concurring to party, depending on location, resource, and interest. The applicant can be also as an invited one because they may have certain responsibilities in carrying out the stipulations of an MOA. And then the public or local government, CLGs, Sometimes those will be involved in particularly complex or controversial projects, the Friends of the Library or Friends of the Bridge or Friends Groups or local government that have their own kind of certified government program. There are many, we've got what, 39, 40 probably local governments from City of Seattle to Spokane County that have their own preservation staff and efforts. Well. I'm kind of running over, but it is a very linear process. And so define the area of potential effect, send that out to who the concerned parties are, and come to a conclusion. And we were going, and we'll probably in the future, hold specific workshops on defining the area of potential effect. It is not just the physical footprint of your construction. It is rather the totality of the impacts associated with your project. And it's three-dimensional, below ground to visibility in terms of height and visible uh, radius of, of uh, impact. 
It can uh, include staging areas, midi off-site mitigation. It can include transportation haul, haul routes for construction activities. So, you know, APAs come in all sites, shapes, and sizes. And the first element is the federal agency has to initiate consultation with the DAP, with the tribal governments, and other parties to define what the geographic polygon will be and discuss at that time your, the agency's identification efforts and any specific studies or methods that need to be used to make and realize a good faith effort to identify historic archaeological and cultural properties. Well, that's where the consultant, you come in, and where the agency representative comes in, and where the tri TIPOs, tribes, and DAP come in in terms of weighing in on methodologies, weighing in if they want to be on site when some of the field work is done, um, reviewing potential drafts or site forms, um, and then ultimately consult with the federal agency consults with the DAP and the tribes and others about what the results of that field effort were. And for agency folks and for consultants, it's important to note the product that you're going to get. You're going to have a project file. You're going to have the letters that you send out to people to establish your administrative record. You're going to have their response letters. Remember, it's a process, and so as a consequence, it's key as a federal agency to document for the administrative record, which is subject to both public and administrative and court review, keep that uh, in a organized manner. Unique about the projects in terms of historic preservation and archaeology is that there is an exempt section. Federal and state law exempt the disclosure of archaeological and cultural, sensitive cultural information from public review, that that information is viewable only to the federal agency in making their decision, the SHPO and the tribal government. And so for those federal agencies, remember the archaeologists in the federal agencies will probably be well versed in keeping their site forms reports uh, maps, DOE forms, et cetera, secured. But for some agencies that don't have professional staff, you may not be used to creating a secured um, locked document section of your project file. Well, we also have separate workshops on evaluating the significance. I'm not going to talk about National Register eligibility and all the rest, since we've got a lot of um, materials on that, we give specific sessions, but the key element is that the federal agency has to make a decision about the National Register eligibility of a property. And he tests that hypothesis or decision with us, the SHPO and the TIPO. If we agree, it's called a consensus determination of eligibility. If any parties agree, disagree, the federal agency can forward it to the keeper of the National Register and the Park Service in Washington and get a definitive answer. And that, of course, is a separate pathway off the side, off the, the main highway and has its own kind of procedure and timelines and documentation. The next step is what's the impact? You've done the study, you've done the evaluation if there are historic properties, which are eligible, which are not. And next is to take and do the filter of what are the actual physical, visual, audible impacts on those significant historic archaeological sites. And there's one of three pathways you can take. No historic properties affected, no adverse effect, and adverse effect. No historic properties affected is probably about 80 to 90% of the projects we review. There's 
the survey's done, the reports are fine, there's nothing there, you've done your due diligence, go forward with your project. No adverse effect has nuanced meeting. That is, your project has a historic property there, eligible, national register, but the change will not damage the qualities that make the resource significant or national register eligible. And again, kind of for common examples would be, you've got a historic building, you're going to, you need to do some uh, work on the roof or whatever, or the siding or the doors. You do a replacement in kind, and there is no change. It does not damage those qualities that make it eligible. For archeology, span most typically no adverse effect occurs where you can avoid the site. You can physically incorporate it into a buffer zone, a preservation zone, a protective zone, so that the project can go forward and there is no alteration. The final one, adverse effect, is where your project will damage that resource, physically or audibly or visually, will change the characteristics that make it significant. And that triggers the need for a memorandum agreement. It's basically a legal document that formalizes the specific actions the federal agency will take to minimize, avoid, or mitigate adverse effects. It's a legal contract. Federal agency is responsible for developing it in consultation with DAP, the SHPO, the tribal governments, must notify the ECHP and invite the participations and to work out a draft agreement. And the draft agreement basically consists of three parts, the stipulations that give you kind of the background factual recitals of the project. The um, stipulations that deal with the actual mitigative avoidance efforts that will be undertaken by the agency or the agency will assure that is undertaken. And then there are kind of administrative contractual provisions on dispute, on reporting, uh, signatory, things like that. And we deal with MOAs all the days, from, all the, every day from uh, implementing ongoing ones to participating in line-by-line -line discussions and crafting new ones. And the final step of the 106 process is basically implementing it. The federal agency reports back to the other consulting parties timely on its implementation, if there's any need for change, and at the end to make sure the conditions were met. There are, as Allison noted, if, if there is no agreement possible, we have some uh, ability to take in effect um, all amendments to MOAs. But as she noted, there's been some recent cases where the federal agency decided to terminate consultation and go back to the advisory council for formal uh, agency to agency head uh, discussions. We also have emergency responses and kind of almost living daily under emergencies these days. But again, they're subject to 106 and federal involvement. FEMA, we have a programmatic agreement that stipulates how we interact with FEMA and declared emergencies. This is an Esqually earthquake that disproportionately affected historic uh, built districts. This is wildfire season and uh, wrapping a historic structure that may be subject to uh, wildfires that we've had uh, in eastern Washington. Oil spills, we routinely deal with oil spills. And again, we have a nationwide agreement and we have not only federal uh, statutory responsibilities, but DAP also is involved with ecology on state level statutory responsibilities with um, oil spill response. And uh, here's one with a train wreck, kind of speaking of current events, so to speak, of uh, uh, both a oil spill, train wreck, and then resulting wildfire. So oftentimes we have multiple kinds of activities in any uh, action. So that was my presentation.
And I guess, I'll, Holly, I'll turn it back to you and how you would like to proceed. Thanks, Rob. Go ahead, Allison. I know you had some, some things yeah, you wanted gonna, to share. I'm going to add some points here. Um, if we talk about 